colleagues joining the uh, Microsoft. It's a great pleasure to have you here, Eric. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. And it's great to see so many people interested in search, a good, healthy thing. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give my perspective on the future of search with the caveat that I'm almost certainly wrong, right? I mean, any of us that are trying to prescribe where we think we're going, um, we're wrong. And, and in reality, there's probably some undergraduate sitting back there who's going to come up with a startup that's going to revolutionize the field and, and put us all out of business, which will be you know, terrible and wonderful at the, the same time. So, so that said, I'm kind of just going to give my perspective on where maybe I would like search to go. And thinking a bit more in terms of paradigm shift, if you think about search over the last five-ish years, there's been a lot of progress, but not really paradigm shifting progress in the way that we fundamentally do things, at least to the extent that, uh, of delivering it to a wide range of customers. There's a lot of really interesting startups, a lot of really interesting ideas, but from the customer's perspective, things have gotten a little bit faster. There's a lot more great content out there, but fundamentally we search the same way, we interact with information the same way, and so that's something worth thinking about. Okay, so here's sort of my, my dream search engine, or, or a dream search engine, um, supersmartsearch.com. And so, you know, when I was making this talk, uh, uh, you know, I was sitting in my office, very, very busy, and, and my um, Outlook beeped and told me that I had to have a talk ready in two days. I was like, ah, forgot about that. And, you know, busy, lots of work to do. Um, so definitely in you know, a case like this, I would love it if I could just go to a search engine and say, you know, kind of outsource it. I have, a th I have to give a 30-minute talk. It has to be about the future of search. It has to be entertaining and thought-provoking, and it should really make me look like a smart, visionary researcher. And there are probably people out there who can do a better job than me, as you'll, as you'll see at this, and so I'm, I'm fine with outsourcing that. And I actually have something to offer in return that, you know, maybe it's worth up to $500 to me, but also I have a bunch of eyeballs. All you guys are looking at this talk, and maybe I'll offer up the very last slide of my talk, which I'll leave on during question answering. So somebody might think, eh, you know, there's a lot of people here with juicy jobs to offer and I want to put my resume up there or what have you. So you know, in reality, this is sort of a market inefficiency that I'm sure there's some human being out there who, for whom the other side of this is a great idea. For me, it certainly is a good idea. And nothing exists to match those right now. And so inefficiencies are great for researchers and inefficiencies are great for, for business. So something to think about. Now, there are a bunch of um, neat startups and non-startups out there that are doing sort of this kind of information brokering currently. There's, there's a company in Incentive where um, an R&D center can post the, their, their R&D ideas and have basically retired scientists who, who are bored have nothing else to do, might as well make some extra money. They can take on these assignments and, and make some money doing that. Um, Topcoders.com is a similar site, which is sort of the, the coding side of that. If you have a big coding job, uh, there are people, you know, maybe in places in the world where it's cheaper to get coders, maybe you don't want to have a big staff because you have sort of a one-off um, big coding task that you need or what have you. Um, DoMyStuff.com is sort of trying to be a very generic version of this. So anything you want done, you post what you want done, you post what it's worth to you, and, and you match. So it's raining outside, you don't feel like walking your dog today, you just say, you know, walk my dog 10 bucks, and somebody out there will walk, hopefully walk your dog. Um, a little bit closer to kind of what, what we're talking about here in search, Naver is a, a really cool um, and popular Korean search engine. And one big component of that search engine is what I call manual question answering. So a person can post a question, and then other people you know, will answer the question. It's driven by, by points and, and whatever, the esteem and so on that comes with these points. And, and in Korea, the, the stars of Naver, the people who actually answer the most questions or are most effective, are actually kind of like rock stars. They go on talk shows, and they're very, they're very well known and famous. So there's kind of a neat way of, again, you can sort of outsource with the right incentives and get, get things done that you'd like to get done. All right, so, um, whoops, slides got messed up a little bit. Anyhow, um, so at a high level, what I want to talk about is sort of thinking about making a paradigm shift, or maybe not a paradigm shift, but a paradigm enhancement, let's say, from what we currently do, which we call document-centric search, um, to being more information-centric. And this actually jives a lot with what a bunch of people before me were, were talking about in, in different ways. So in document-centric search, that's what you know, all of us search engines are doing now and doing a pretty good job of now, where you, query, you get a query, you give a query to a search engine, you get back a you know, list of results. It's basically a list of documents or, or you know, pointers to, to web pages. Now, that's often exactly the right thing to do. Um, in every search engine, Yahoo is one of the most popular queries, and presumably somebody just wants Yahoo, you know, a link to the Yahoo page in that case, and we all do a fantastic job on that, and you know, kudos to us for doing great, great technology there. Um, you know, Peter Norvig's homepage, again, in that case, I'm probably looking for a very specific page, so this document-centric view is just the right thing to do. Um, I want to read up on Montessori education. So there, let's just say I have an afternoon to spare, and I just want to kind of you know, browse like I would go to Borders to browse and just find some stuff and, and see some stuff on there. Again, this paradigm isn't quite perfect, but it's probably good enough. You get back a set of documents. Some of them are garbage. Some of them aren't on topic. But a lot of them are on topic. Some are redundant. But you get, you get a decent collection of things um, that you can read. So, so you know, again, for many, many needs of our, of our customers or of us, document-centric search is fantastic. 
Um, but if we want to really push, there are a lot of cases where it doesn't work well. So let's look at, for inf thinking more for information-centric search, where I don't want a document, I want information, and that's really the, sort of the fundamental thing I want. Um, take a query like, what companies has Microsoft acquired since 1995, and how have those acquisitions gone? So the Yahoo people in the audience might be interested in this at, at the moment, given, <laughs> the, <laughs> given the recent buzz or, or, or news going on. But again, this is difficult for a number of reasons. The, the, maybe there's not a single web page that has that information of, of the list of acquisitions. And the, how have these acquisitions gone is a very subjective question, which probably can't be answered from a single source, but has to be answered by calling a bunch of sources and kind of figuring things out. Uh, should I send my child to a Montessori school? There, well, I mean, I guess there is an answer, a true answer, yes or no, but it's very much, again, subjective on me specifically, my child specifically, my, my particular world configuration, even where I live. Maybe Montessori schools are crummy in Seattle and wonderful in San Francisco or what have you. So you can really think here, it's information where I want to have an interaction with somebody, not find some kind of ready-made piece of information, and even worse yet, ready-made piece of information embedded in a document out there, which is what we, the world that we're currently in. Uh, same sort of rationale for a question like, should I splurge and buy the NVIDIA 8800 GTX video card? I mean, that's a very contextual question. Um, splurge means different things to different people based on their income. Um, what you're going to do with that card may, may influence that and so on. Um, pros and cons and tips on raising a child to be bilingual. I want to spend a, fl a week fly fishing in Montana. Help, please. So again, these are cases where there might be something out there. So you know, a blog, here's my great fly fishing trip I did in Montana. But that's one particular person who's very different than me, who likes different things than me and so on. So that kind of ready-made stuff wrapped up in documents um, often is just the right thing to do, but often isn't. And I think importantly also, the, these latter cases are, are cases where our customers you know, feel a lot of pain. So we, you know, we'd love it for the cases where you know, helping people find information on Christina Aguilera in you know, 30 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds is a wonderful thing to do, but helping somebody find you know, that perfect fly fishing trip that maybe takes a week to plan now and having them be able to do that in minutes would be, sort of, you know, in terms of the marginal gain, might be, might be better. So I did steal one slide of mine. I, I tend to like not, I tend to make, make slides from scratch because it gets boring to talk about the same thing over and over. So, but I, I did steal one slide um, back when we were working on automatic question answering. And I think this slide is kind of crummy, but it kind of gets the point across that if you're looking, sometimes you're looking for a particular nugget of information. So you're looking for that nugget of information. It happens to be embedded in a number of different documents. And so currently what we do is we return that list of documents, or a list of documents, hopefully some of which have that nugget of information inside of them, um, maybe some don't. But in reality, at least in the, in the case of short answer question answering, like you know, when was Bill Gates born or, or what have you, if you want that particular nugget of information, you know, the documents are secondary. And so we'd like a system, a question answering system, that rips the documents apart, grabs that information, and returns the particular thing that you want. So we used to be very excited about this sort of short answer question answering. But, but then you know, when you play with it, you realize that this is not really kind of you know, akin to curing cancer, that if the, if the right answer is in that first document, you're saving the user a little bit of time in putting it in their face. But you know, they can usually find that answer somewhere in the document, um, especially the kinds of question answering that we're currently good at. Um, what's much more exciting is sort of, let's say, really complicated functions of that information. So that question like, you know, should I buy the NVIDIA, blah, 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 um, you know, that's really a, a bunch of people saying information about that. And you could say, you know, um, most people think this or most people think of that. But really what you want to know is people similar to me, what are they thinking about or what's the current news on it? You know, are they, are they suddenly all lighting on fire? Do I need to know that? You know, and so on. Um, and even more importantly, when you're looking for information that doesn't exist in that pool of information that you're, that you're able to grab out of the documents, what do you do in a case like that? Okay, so if we look at, the, look at just the top, I don't know what pointer here, the top thing, that sort of just thinking about the most beautiful, pure information exchange, um, kind of a, a good prototypical example of this is think of the information needer being a husband and the information provider is the wife. And the husband asks, when, when's your birthday? And the wife says, my birthday is June 3rd, done. And it's, you know, it's, it's perfect, you know, perfect information exchange where the communication goes well, there's a perfect incentive for that. You absolutely know who to ask that question to. You, know, you sort of trust that person to tell you the right, the right answer because you're sort of in sync in, in terms of um, you know, goals and so on. And then if you look at the bottom, that, that's sort of a, a, another you know, um, case where you sort of a perfect information exchange where you have an employee, let's say at a big company like Microsoft, and we have a bunch of corporate librarians. And there, you know, if I need a report on Walmart's impact on the organic food industry, I can, I can email or call the librarian. And we can actually have a really deep conversation on this. What do you actually need it for? What are you looking for? Iterate on the response. Um, and in the end, I get a result, which is typically a document with pointing to lots of references, um, the, the librarian having, having done all the hard work for me in that case. Uh, and there's really good incentive for the librarian to do that, namely, they want to keep their job. And that's their, you know, ha me being happy keeps them happy because they stay employed. Uh, so this is sort of you know, a very nice, pure case of information exchange, which, of course, trying to project this to more, being more generic for any information, you encounter tons and tons of problems. 
Um, one problem is, you know, expert to novice imbalance. So there tend to be, in any field, way more novices than experts in anything. And so if the expert's going to sort of say, I'll help anybody that needs help, they're going to be inundated with tons and tons of, of questions and not have time for it. Uh, timeliness uh, is another issue. You know, if you, I don't know, if you just accidentally stab yourself in the foot and you want to know you're supposed to pull the knife out before you go to the hospital or wait to go to the hospital, you kind of want that answered, you know, really, really quickly. And you sort of want to have a bound on when you'd get that answered. Um, finding a quality information provider. In both of these cases, we sort of knew who to go to for the particular question, but often that isn't the case. And even if you do find an information provider, kind of knowing what are their biases, you know, are they, do they have the proper incentive to tell me the right answer versus just giving me any answer or what have you. Um, properly expressing information, skip that. In, the incentive is, is an issue, and information diversity is also an issue. You know, if, you, if you ask a question, who should I vote for for president, and you know, one person says Hillary Clinton, well, if you want a second opinion, you probably don't want the second opinion to be Hillary Clinton for the exact same reasons, because you're trying to sort of learn the different, different views on the matter. And so kind of thinking about um, you know, marginal relevance, that once you've found one person who provides you one view, same thing like for Montessori schools. If somebody says Montessori schools are the best thing in the world because blah, 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 if I'm going to go to a second person, I'd actually like somebody who says Montessori schools are the worst thing in the world because blah, 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 because then I have you know, information for me to make a smart decision. So let's, let's contrast that, sort of the pure person-to-person -person information exchange with, with this more, with the document-centric search that, that really a search engine is more just the mediator in that for, for, for us. And so take an example where we have somebody who's a Seattle Ethiopian restaurant expert. And we have another person on the other side who's a hungry person who wants to know, you know, what is, what is a good Seattle Ethiopian restaurant for them to go to tonight? Um, now, the way it currently happens is that basically at some point that Seattle Ethiopian restaurant expert sits down and decides to sort of codif codify their, what they know, that you know, here's my favorite restaurants, here's some restaurants that aren't that good, I found a mouse at this restaurant, blah, 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 and you know, puts that into a document. The document sort of will get indexed by a search engine, and then when the hungry person wants to know about, about Ethiopian restaurants, they'll query Ethiopian restaurants Seattle or, or some such query. They'll get back a set of documents, hopefully one of which will be this person's document. Um, they look through that and they get, they get that information. So this is good and bad. Uh, it's good because it solves this many to one problem, right? So now if this person really does think that Blue Nile is the best restaurant and, and they're a real expert, they only have to say that once, right? They write it once in the document and they're not annoyed by 6,000 people calling them and saying, what's your favorite restaurant? And them having to say Blue Nile um, 6,000 times. And it may solve the expert match problem and that the hungry person who's trying to find an expert um, on, on Ethiopian restaurants, well, the search engine kind of does all that heavy lifting for you, right? The search engine can figure out that for that particular query, if you actually gave a good query for your intent, that this is one of the most relevant documents. So they can sort of surface the, the document written by the expert sort of as a proxy for the expert and, and their expertise. Um, but there are a bunch of problems with this. One is that it's asynchronous and low bandwidth. So, you know, this is something that that person wrote. Actually, in the Seattle example, I, I do go to the site a lot. They wrote it two and a half years ago. They've, they haven't updated it. You know, restaurants change, go out of business, new ones come, and so on. So it's just sort of a freeze frame of that person's expertise at that point. Um, and it's also, you know, it, it's asynchronous and low bandwidth in the sense that maybe I, I have some questions. Like, I want an Ethiopian restaurant that's child-friendly or that they, they let you modify the spiciness or things like that. And again, there's a person there who, who can answer that and may actually be willing to answer that if we have the right incentive, but through this sort of, you know, um, using the document as, as the only means of transferring the information, we lose that capability. Um, okay. So there's, there's a wonderful potential answer to this, to this problem, which is human question answering. I mentioned Naver early on as an example of that. There are a bunch of others, Yahoo Answers, Live Answers. Uh, Google used to have an a question answer system where you could pay for people to answer your questions. And in theory, these are all you know, really, this is a really cool idea that, that should work very well, that basically now you have some information need, real time you can post your question to answers.foo.com, whatever, whatever foo site you want to go to, and you have a bunch of experts over there who typically, you know, monitor the site, and when they think they can answer a question, they try to answer the question, and they, you know, in this case their incentive is points, and, and that seems to be a decent incentive for a number of people. Um, so one would think that this could be sort of the trick to, to solving this problem of, you know, person to person with this, with this sort of middle, middleware that, that matches the people in the questions. Um, the problem is it actually doesn't work very well. So, I mean, there are cases where it works well, but if you really use this, and if you kind of ask users, you know, do people really use this for their tough questions? No. And so I'll, I'll give you just a couple of examples um, of this. I, I won't say which, which, question, which system it was to be, to be um, company neutral here, but a system, and they all do more or less the same thing. So what are the pros and cons of raising a bilingual child? I, I posted this to one of the sites. I picked three just random 
random answers to that. There were no high quality answers, first of all. And you know, one person says, can't think of any cons unless there are detectable foreign accents. Another one says, I know of no downside. Um, another one says, the more languages a child can speak, the better in my book. So you know, the fact that Husiad thinks more is better isn't really going to be something I'm going to decide how I should you know, um, raise my children based on that. So it's really, this is really more akin to going to a bar and saying, hey, what do you guys think about bilingual children or, or something along those lines, not really trying to get the, the, the information at the level that you want to. And it's, it's sort of interesting, so I can contrast this with the opposite, or sort of a perfect example. That in this particular case, it happens to be the case that one of my best friend's wives is a, is a second language um, acquisition expert, and so she and a friend are writing a book on bilingualism. So I sent her email asking her opinion on that, got you know, a perfect answer, including, well, some people disagree with me because of this, and here's a point to that, and so on. So you know, there, there is a perfect answer out there. That's sort of a, an artificial case in the sense that I knew that person, so that you know, I, could, I knew who to ask, and she also, because of the you know, whatever, friend of a friend had some incentive to be nice to me and spend some time and, and not lie to me and, and so on. But, but there is this big inefficiency that which, this kind of market of, of answers and questions, which we'd love to work well, doesn't really work well compared to what you can get. Um, just one more little example of, of this. But you know, if, you, if you haven't used these answer sites, you, just, you can just post whatever questions you want and get a feel for them. Um, but so, I don't, can you see that? Yeah. Do you burn more calories walking an hour at three miles an hour or running? 30 minutes at 6 miles an hour, and why? And so, again, I'd love it if I could just post to this, go to that site, and, have, and feel like, aha, now I know the answer. I know, you know how to win a bet against, with my friend by saying the answer is blah, blah. And so you, know, you get a bunch of answers here. Um, I don't know. The first one is doubtful. Don't know what that means. You probably end up burning the same amount. One guess is running. Another one says the same. Another one says it's the same because of physics or something. And so, you know, again, it's interesting, but it's like chit-chatting at a bar. I'm not going to now say, I know the answer to that question. It's, it's, it's not really... You know, getting there. Um, one more example of sort of a paradigm that should be sort of fantastic, but again, doesn't really work, is that there's a, there's a company, Kasamba, and there's a number of companies like this, where there um, you have, they have a, a pool of uh, tens of thousands of people who label themselves experts in certain areas, and you can now ask these people um, basically for advice, if you want job advice or this advice or that advice, and then you talk to them on the phone, they, they tell the rates or they negotiate rates with you, and this again in theory could be a fantastic fantastic idea, um, it also you know, solves the bandwidth problem um, solves a lot of other problems, but in reality it just doesn't work, and so you know, anecdotally you can kind of look at what you get for these things I mean, here I gave the query job advice, and so you know, Autumn Dancing Hard and Febreze and Soul Helper are my, my top choices to give me job advice which probably aren't, for my particular job advice probably not the right people um, so anecdotally it doesn't really work, but it, you know it also, sort of, if you don't take the anecdotal side, people don't go to this. I mean, I doubt anybody in this room you know, lives in, on this site except you know, for psychic advice or something else, but you probably don't go to this for, for big, interesting needs. And that's interesting because there does seem to be this case where you do have this imba market imbalance like my very first slide, and this could be an, an approach at, at tackling that. So this is sort of posed, I mean, it's always fun giving a talk like this because I don't have to have the answers. I can just pose the questions. Um, but I think one thing to really think through and, and I'm really excited about is kind of, why aren't these answer sites utopian wonderful? So again, in theory, these would just be fantastic. I have any information need, I have any question, there's an imbalance, we figure out the right incentive, I get that thing solved, right? We don't need any AI, we don't need to, natural language understanding, we're all built with that inside, so we don't, you know, don't need, to under, don't need to solve any really hard technical problems necessarily. Um, so I don't know why they, they don't really work. I have some you know, sort of shots or possible shots at that. I think one thing is, well, one, it might just be a boring answer that nobody's really just executed correctly, right? I mean, if you're, if you're putting something out, it might, it might just be just the right UI or just the right this or just the right that. So that's possible, but there are probably some more fundamental reasons. One is that, like, for the, let's say for the Yahoo and, and MSN sites and sites that are point-based, there's no real strong incentive for A-plus answers. So if you ask a really tough question that requires an hour of research on my point, if I get it right, I get whatever it is, 10 points. But also if I get the question, you know, who's the cutest person on American Idol right, I also get 10 points. And so that, you know, I can answer that question in, in no time. I can answer these deep questions in, in a lot of time. And the, and the point system is sort of not inducing me to, to be an A-plus answer. Also the fact that there's not a real community there. You kind of go there and leave there, and people are either cartoon names or fake names typically. So you're not really building up a real reputation other than through these, these points. Um, likewise, no strong disincentive against C-minus answers. Uh, low bandwidth and little iteration. The, the phone example kind of gets around that a bit, but you know, when you post a question, like, like that question I, I asked about, um, you know, about bilingual children, well, those could have been the right answers if I'm a third grader who's just like, hey, I'm just curious about this, what, what do y'all think? Or if I'm somebody trying to you know, make a life decision for my children's education, there's two different answer sets, and you can't really tell who I am based on 
based on this. Um, another possibility, which might be a hard one to overcome, but if we can get the incentives just right, is that smart, articulate people typically have day jobs. And so you, know, you might not have a big pool of people who are available um, to answer, you know, especially for free or for points, these really, really hard questions. Um, and, and then the last point is this, who am I, who are, who are you, which I sort of alluded to, that we don't really know who I am as the questioner. You don't really know who you are as the answer. And because of that, you don't get that kind of deep exchange. Like when I, when I talk to my friend's wife, who she knows me, she understands sort of, you know, at what level I'm answering this, that I understand linguistics at some level, blah, 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 blah. Um, th now, there are cases where it seems to work very well. I just put two examples up there. Microsoft has this MVP program. And what that is is that every year we certify something like 2,500 people as being particularly um, helpful in, in online and offline communities. These are people who aren't Microsoft employees but are just helpful at answering questions. And so you get this label. It's actually an official label. And in, in that case, and there is sort of this nice quality control that you really do have an incentive to be you know, to answer well, to go out of your way to answer. And this translates into, it could just be ego that you sort of have this certification from Microsoft saying you're a very helpful person, but it also probably translates into some serious money that you can up your, you know, you can up the amount of money, the amount of money you charge for consulting, you can up the chances of getting a good job and so on. So there's a good incentive alignment in, in that case, even though it's a very broad community of, of people. And another example, and there's lots of this flavor out there, um, I'm a fly fishing addict, and so there's a site, washingtonflyfishing.com, and there, it's an online forum, and it really works well, and you have extremely helpful people who will spend a lot of time helping you. And there what happens is there's sort of a small core of people, even though it's open to the whole world, there's a small core of people who are always there. And so, you know, even if my name is Joe372 or something, that the fact that I'm on and have a history there means there is, a re there is an incentive for me to kind of get my reputation known because then people are more likely to help me later on. So, again, I don't really have an answer, but there are cases where it does seem to work. And if we could figure out how to move that forward, that would be, I think, to me, very exciting. Um, so thinking about opportunities, you know, from the research perspective, I mean, first one's just the big, you know, how the heck do we do this question and, and thinking deeply about that. But there's, there's a few things I think that we could really drill into. So one is thinking about load balancing. So, you know, probably a lot of us get mail from random people saying, hey, I read your paper, blah, 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 and I want information about it. And, you know, we're all, all, all we're altruistic up to a point, right? So if, if, if one lady wants to cross the street, an old lady, I'll, I'll help her. If, you know, 10,000 do, I have to go home and feed my kids and may not have time for that. So thinking about a case of load balancing where I'm willing to answer, you know, X questions a month for something and, and Y questions a month for something else, and then, and then to load balance that to, to use the time I'm willing to give. Um, impedance matching in the sense that if I'm only willing to, let's say, answer, I'm, I'm a fly fishing expert, I know all the great places to fish, I'm willing to answer, let's say, five questions a month on fly fishing. Well, if there's a third grader who's just curious where to fly fish, and somebody whose dying father's last wish was to go to the best fly fishing place in Seattle, and only one of those two can have my time, you, know, you want to probably put the, the kid to somebody that, that isn't as much of an expert, maybe the more important one to, to somebody who's more of an expert. Um, and this whole thing of riffing on points, so really figuring out what the right incentive structure is. Again, you know, like I'm, I know Pearl really, really well. Um, and it's not really fun for me just to answer people's random Pearl questions and Pearl bugs, but I'm just starting to try. I, I want to learn how to play guitar. And so here's a case where if somebody knows guitar well, I'll, change, you know, I'll, I'll exchange Pearl, Pearl debugging for, for guitar help. And so there's a lot of those kinds of inefficiencies out there, which could be a way for us to incentivize this kind of you know, harder question answering. Um, and so, so to, to sum up, um, really thinking about sort of a, a paradigmatic change and the from two is not quite right, but thinking about going, you know, th we, right now we look at document delivery and thinking of that in addition, when that makes sense, that's great, but a lot of times it doesn't make sense. And so thinking about moving more towards finding information you need, and since people typically are the best at communicating information and that the, the document often isn't the right intermediary for that, finding the right person who can answer the question for you. So I'll, I'll skip my last slide, which is just that data matters and we want to give you data, but that's that, and that's all. Thank you so much. I have a question about Eric's talk, but it's for Peter, which is just why, why it seems that money uh, would be a pretty good currency that would address a lot of what you're saying, too. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a little bit surprising that uh, Google Answers was discontinued based on money, especially since uh, Mechanical Turk uh, appears by at least some accounts to be working pretty well, like in different amounts and so on. But I'm just curious if you could answer. Sorry to steal your time. That's but, fine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm curious, too. And, you know, I... I I think uh, Yahoo and Naver and the others who've done this successfully deserve a lot of credit. They put together good sites that, that work for the types of things they're trying to get at. 
in Google Answers, we were trying to get at this more smart, articulate people who who could be doing other things with their time, you know. So our answerers had two, HB, two PhDs and spoke five languages, and they were these overqualified people. Uh, but I think the main reason is that the people asking questions are just irrational, right? So, <laughs> you know, they'd rather spend three hours of their own time for which they can bill twenty, fifty dollars an hour or whatever, rather than pay out ten dollars to have somebody else answer it for them. But I, th I think for, go for Google Answers, I think there's one other possibility, which is in a search engine, you sort of have a bound to when you know if you'll get it or not get it. So if I need an answer by tonight, if I go to a search engine and do two searches and don't get it, I know I'll fail. Whereas if I post something, if I like with Yahoo and MSN, it's actually nice because you get these, they're junky answers, but you get them within five minutes typically. So you know you're going to get a bunch of junky answers. For the Google thing, I think you could get one Wonderful answers, but sometimes it would take days to close, and so you, you, do, you have that uncertainty for, for when you're going to get or if you're going to get the answer. So uh, I actually disagree with your conclusion that those generic answer sites are not successful. They're clearly successful. They attract huge amounts of people, and they grow like weeds. Yeah, traffic-wise, they're uh, successful. And uh, I think the point is that you should not judge them by as an information gathering activity. They are an entertainment activity, and yep. they are entertaining. I mean, you know, the stupidity of the answer by itself <laughs> is entertaining. No, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, judge like that, it's, it's kind of fun, and, and you start participating, and, and people get into this game of points, uh, and, and they participate, and, and actually some of the answers are, are true and correct. But you judge by your own experience, you say, I wouldn't spend two hours reading silly questions and silly answers, but, but, you know, there are millions of people that are willing to do that. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Peter was saying that artificial intelligence is the future of search, and you're saying that human stupidity is the future of search. <laughs> I, 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 I think it's very hard to make an artificial intelligence mechanism that will entertain people. I think being entertaining is, is much more difficult for artificial intelligence than, and, and than can for you people. Repeat again because we have viewers that actually uh, looking at from his webcasting did not hear you. Um, Sorry, I don't know. I don't know what. Okay. <laughs> 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 entertainment. You said that entertainment is much more difficult to generate using artificial intelligence. Automating entertainment. I believe I heard him say that entertainment is much more difficult to generate using artificial intelligence than simple information. I, I was glad to see you had some slides with the word finding up there because this whole future of search. Uh, to me, it's really about finding, and I'd rather not have to search. I just want to find mm -hmm. the answer. Yep, I agree with that. So uh, I think uh, before that, uh, I was talking to Marty that because we were just like short on time, and she had 30 minutes and then 20 minutes. I said, like, what about if we had a system that we say, like, wait a minute, you know, I am now only have 20 minutes, and these are my constraints. And I'll so compress. I have to change it also. Can you put it in a sequential? Because now the problem is much, much harder because the sequence also is important mm -hmm. to be included onto that one. Hope someday we get actually to that point too. Maybe so yeah. once more, thank you, Eric, for being here and writing.